Hey man of family, and also hello to our wonderful guests. We're so pumped y'all are here with us today. My name is Sam and I wanna welcome you to Mana Church. Today we're about to begin part two of our current sermon series, Salt and Light. But first, let's worship God together. Love in his eyes, his body broken with no sin to hide. And I see my Jesus, eyes burn with.
Hey again, we're so excited that you're here. I would like to welcome those of you who may be joining us for the first time here on Mana Online. If that's you, we thank you so much for being our guest. There's a simple way to let us know that you are here with us. I invite you to text the word guest to the number you see on your screen right now. In fact, if you have been watching Mana Online for a while, you too can text the word guest to the number that you see on your screen. We really want to hear from you. We have a team that wants to contact you this week to see how we can serve you and help get you connected. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you'll join us again very soon. At this time, I want to invite you to participate in worship through giving. We give of our finances to the Lord as a way of demonstrating to Him that we are putting Him first and that we are following His ways. If you currently give online through the web or the Mana Church app, continue to do so. If you would like to give online today, you can give via PayPal simply by texting the word MANA to the number that you see on your screen. Not hard at all. If you would like to write a check, make it out to Mana Church. You could also mail it in or drop it off at our Cliffdale site in the Fayetteville region. If you're our guest today, please feel no obligation to give financially. Let's pray now over the offering. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you came and that you died for us. We give back to you what is already yours. Lord, we ask that these finances that have been given today will be used to advance your kingdom throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. We're almost ready to dive into part two of our current sermon series, Salt and Light. Before we do, check out these video announcements. The Experience is a full-time college internship that combines formal academics with practical hands-on training outside of the classroom. Through specific ministry tracks, interns will establish a foundation in faith, character, and leadership. For more info, join us for our info night, March 26, 6.30 p.m. at the Cliffdale site. We'll see you there. What's up, man of church? My name is Chris, and I'm here to give it my best shot. So I want to say welcome to each and every one of you, whether you're in the room with me right now or this is a, this is a special one that you all picked to be a part of, all right? You know who's on the other end of that camera? Mana Online and the microsite. So listen, listen, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Mana Church's movement to multiply across the military highway has some heroes that are associated with it, but none so heroic as the men and women who have begun the, the, the microsite journey in their living room, in a CrossFit gym, wherever they are right now, I'm gonna tell you what, there's some heroes of the faith on the other end of that camera. Can we join together in making them feel welcome right now? Well, like I said, my name's Chris and you've joined us for what is kind of a doozy because on Sunday morning, we're gonna be in... Segra Stadium where it's going to shine bright, so bright I'm going to have to wear my shades. That's me speaking in faith, but I want you to join me in praying that the Lord gives us, you know, some fantastic weather because that would certainly be amazing. Now, we're in the second week of a series that we've entitled Salt and Light, and we're talking about outreach. We're talking about a culture of outreach. We're talking about outreach as we walk it out as individuals at the same time as we walk it out collectively. So last week, we talked about salt. This week, we're going to talk about light. And I've got one for you that perhaps might be a little bit illuminating. 
in a word? So anyway, most of you probably know my uh, much, 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 much younger brother, John. <laughs> show of hands, anybody know John? Yeah, also show of hands. Are there any oldest siblings in the room? Oh, you're gonna love this one then, okay. So um, I was, I, my, my wife and I went to uh, John and Heather's house the other day and uh, I went upstairs with John. We went into his, into his study and there was a light bulb that was out. Not only was it out, there wasn't even a bulb, like there wasn't even a bulb in there. So I said, hey, hey buddy, um, I, I'm here. I could help you change that light bulb if you wanted. So he said, sure, absolutely. So I grabbed one. I got up there, you know, got a little, got a little stool, got up there and screwed it right on in and it turned on and he was like, wow, how, I didn't know that's how you did that. I said, well, pal, how, how, uh, how have you been doing it? So he went, he, he got the light bulb, and then he just kind of stood up there and he just held it. And I said, well, uh, we might have found our problem. What, what did you think was going to happen next? And he said, well, I just figured the world would revolve around me like it always does. I do have to tell you, there was some innocent splashback in that joke right there. If you've not met my sister-in-law, Heather, this is one of the nicest and most wonderful women ever on the planet. She just made one mistake and she's stuck with it for life now. But, um, <laughs> stop, stop. Y'all, I've got to reel this one back in or we're just going <laughs> to have a whole situation on our hands. Listen, without a question... The Lord, when he ascended to his father's right hand, Jesus left his church with a commission. Uh, you might, you, it, was, <laughs> it was a great commission. Uh, it, it's recorded in the gospels, in all four gospels, and also recorded in uh, the, the book of Acts. But I think probably the most famous rendition of it comes in Matthew chapter 28. And so I wanna turn there really quickly because I wanna start off. You, you're not gonna be able to talk about outreach. You're not gonna be able to talk about being salt and light unless we talk about the Great Commission. So if you turn with me, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 28, and I'm going to read from verses 18 through 20. And as my pages stick together and I have to lick my finger to unstick them, I should probably warn you that for this series, we decided on uh, the NIV, which may not mean much to some of you, but growing up as a kid, I thought the NIV was the new inferior version because that's what my dad called it when I was younger. Come to find out, I think he only said that because my mom was apparently reading it at the time. And so then they, you know, they fought, they made up. And I think John was born nine months later. But um, that's, that's, I, gotta, <laughs> I don't know what's happening right now. Let's get to the scripture. Let's just bathe ourselves in the word, shall we? Probably going to get an email about that one. My email is jonathan.fletcher at manna.church. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Now the Bible doesn't underline the word go, but the word go is underlined on your screen for emphasis. You see, the very first foundational understanding of an outreach culture, of a culture that's gonna embrace the idea that we're called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world is it's gonna take some going. We're going to have to go out. What do you mean by go? We're going to have to go outside of the walls of our collective. What does that mean? Well, when we gather together as a small group, that's important. And it's a vital part of what we do at Manna Church. When we gather together on the weekend, when we worship the Lord, when we invite his presence, when we hear from his word, that's a vital part of what we do as a church. But the thing is, in order to be salt and light, it's going to require some movement from where we are currently. We're going to have to go. The Great Commission says, therefore, go. Go and do what? Go and make disciples. Can I tell you, the, the commission, the, the, the mission that Jesus left his church was to make disciples of everyone. Make disciples, doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I told you that this was the mission that Jesus left his church. Now, I've heard it voiced that, well, you know, every church, every church has a mission. And I don't disagree with that statement. But when I read the Great Commission, I almost wonder if we shouldn't think about it this way. We should think about it a little bit differently. It's not that every church has a mission. It's that Jesus' mission on the planet has a church. Jesus', Jesus mission on the planet is for his church, his bride, the body of Jesus, you and I, we're called to advance the kingdom. 
What do you mean by advance the kingdom? We're called to spread the gospel. We are sent here to the planet to both live and to do outreach. Now, you know, I just did it again. Like, well, we were, we were here in the blessed series and there you were, you were taking this whole being and doing thing and splitting them apart. I kind of did it again a little bit with outreach because what I said was, we're called to live. That's kind of encapsulated in this idea of being the salt of the earth. We're meant to, in, we're meant to encapsulate, we're meant to be, we're meant to, we're meant to be salty and we're meant to do outreach. We gotta go. It's gotta be some movement. We got some work to do. So today we're going to talk from the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to tell his followers about how they're meant to live in the world. And in order to do that, he's going to use a couple of analogies. And these analogies are not limited only to the Sermon on the Mount. We discussed last, last week how uh, we, we referenced a, a passage from Luke. We also talked about the fact that it's referenced again in Mark chapter 9. It was referenced in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus reaches for the first analogy in this little pericope, which is basically a big word that John made up to mean, um, I'm kidding, he didn't. But he knows what it means, and I mispronounced it for the longest time, so he just wants to show off that he knows how to say it. Now I'm doing it too. Pericope is basically a, a paragraph here in Scripture in order to start the analogy, Jesus reaches for the salt first. But then second, he's gonna introduce this other analogy that he uses quite a bit in scripture, and that is light. So we discussed last week that Jesus' expectation of his followers is to be the salt of the earth. And Jonathan rightly kind of broke this into two kind of, kind of camps of this idea of, of salt. Really, there's the, there's the side of being the salt of the earth that means it's our job to bring joy. It's our job to bring flavor. It's our job to bring life. I don't know if you've ever eaten something that was, you know, kind of bland, you know, best effort, whatever. Put some salt on it, baby, you got a stew going. You know what I mean? I mean, sometimes it gets a little bit out of hand. And maybe if your doctor says it gets out of hand, then don't, you know, just calm down with the salt some. But salt was meant to bring joy and flavor and life. At the same time, the flip side to the coin, salt and what Jesus was communicating to his followers is you're meant to be the preservation of society. You're meant to be the cleansing agent in society. In order to fulfill the function that Jesus left us with, in order to fulfill the commission that Jesus left us with, we have got to be salty. And now this week, we're gonna illuminate, gonna shed some light on the second half of this analogy sandwich. If you'll join me, I'm in Matthew chapter five. I'm gonna to read to you from verses 14 through 16 while making uh, as minimal comment as possible, but I am a Fletcher, which means comments are gonna be you know, the, the rule of the day. It's my wife's favorite thing about me, all the comments. Matthew chapter five, verse 14. Wow, that landed like some of you were like, wow, he must be serious. It was sarcasm, it was a good start. Matthew chapter five, verse 14 starts off this way. You are the light of the world. Now, I don't know how your mind works, but this is just the way that my, you know, raised in the 80s, this is just the way my mind works. Jesus has just told his followers that he wants them to be salty and lit. <laughs> You're the salt of the earth and the light of the world? Oh, okay, anyway. Simmer down. So the, <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount isn't super duper far into Jesus' ministry. He's using this light analogy, and this light analogy, you've actually, you've heard this before, right? Jesus has referenced himself as the light of the world. As a matter of fact, in the, uh, Matthew chapter four, Jesus has actually, Jesus actually said that this is, that his coming is a fulfillment of prophecy. He's actually said, he's told, he's told the people that he was preaching to in that moment that a light has dawned. So as a matter of fact, just like salt, light is an analogy that Jesus is gonna use other places in the gospels. And as a matter of fact, when we talk about light, Jesus says, you are the light of the world, but he said something that sort of helps us understand what he meant when he said, you are the light of the world, because he can't mean that I'm the light of the world. He probably means he's the light of the world. I wonder if there's something that could shed some light on this. Let's flip over to John chapter eight and verse 12. Jesus is gonna talk about light again. He says this, when Jesus spoke to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Got it, clear. I'm not the light, Jesus is the light. So what is he saying on the Sermon on the Mount when he says, you are the light of the world? Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
So Jesus has just said to his followers in Matthew 5 that you're the light of the world, but he's not contradicting himself because we see here in John 8 that, that he obviously is the light. So what are we to conclude from Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14? That is that he is the light and we are carriers or reflectors of the light that he brings. This reminds me of something we talked about in the Beatitudes series, in the Blessed series. We talked about being poor in spirit, meaning we recognize that we don't bring anything to the equation. I recognize that it's Jesus and nothing else. Jesus and nothing else equals everything for me. I recognize I don't bring anything to the equation. It's not my light. It's not my salt. It's not my truth. It's not my, it's obedience and surrender to him. And Jesus through me is the one who brings light to this equation. Are we good? Good with this. All right. Brightness isn't, it's not, it's not my light. It's not our light. And it's not something that we get by actions that we do in order to, I don't know, be better or to be salty. You want to, if you want your light to shine brighter, if you want to grow in saltiness, if you want to grow in all of these things, the way that this comes is by surrender and time with him. More light, all this has to do with purity and holiness. These are two concepts that we unpacked pretty heavily last week when we talked about being the salt of the earth. We talked about what's Jesus saying? If you're going to be the preservation and cleansing, it means you've got to be holy, which means what? Distinct. It means we have to be different. So we go back to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, earlier in the Beatitudes, talks about purity. As a matter of fact, it references purity pretty clearly. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. My progression in holiness, my progression in purity, the closer that I get to him, the more of himself he reveals to me, which then empowers me to be the salt and the light. We keep going in this little fun little circle of everything being about my relationship with him. This is entirely about surrender and obedience. You're picking up what I'm throwing down. Jesus goes on in Matthew 5, 14 though. He starts off and says, you are the light of the world. Then he says something fairly interesting. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Now I say this is interesting because who would think that a town built somewhere up high could be hidden? I mean, that doesn't even make sense to us, right? It doesn't make any sense how something like that could be could be cloaked at all. And there's an idea ringing in the heads of Jesus' followers from what he's just talked about a minute ago. They've gotten the idea because in the first little section he's talked about salt and so they've gotten distinctness and they've gotten holiness. They have this set apart. So Jesus has just used this salt analogy. You are salt and light and a town on a hill can't be hidden. What's he saying to you? He's saying there's something distinct about you. He's saying there's distinctness that's inside of you and he's saying that that's something that's inside of you, you can't withdraw and you can't hide it. Can I tell you something? The Bible does not preach, the Bible does not preach um, that you are, you know, the, the, Bible, the Bible preaches, I said the Bible doesn't preach and then my mind started to formulate an idea and then it completely went out of my head. So I'll tell you what the Bible does preach. The Bible preaches the distinctness and the specialness with which God shaped you. It says in Psalm 139 that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. You were created on purpose and for a purpose. And here's the thing. That purpose is to know him and to make him known. And the more that you do that, the saltier we become. The thing is, the light, the the, the bringing the light analogy in here, we are both the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And the thing is, in order to fulfill our design, we've got to be salty, but we also can't hide the light that we've got. We cannot hide the light that we've got. It's, th- this, is, this is one of the defining and really driving ideas about man of church. This concept right here about outreach and a city on a hill, the light of the world. Outreach is the heartbeat of church and the church is a force because we're called to be a city on a hill and we can't possibly hide that. We're obligated to shine the light that he, the light of life, it says in John 8, the light of life that is alive in us because of what Jesus did on the cross. We are obligated to shine our light and to share our saltiness. We're obligated to do that. He keeps going in Matthew 5, verse 15. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. So we've already established that Jesus is the light. Our job is to reflect the light. Our job is to carry the light that he's placed in our hearts. We're to be the city on the hill. But this verse adds a little bit of weight to what Jesus is communicating to his followers. The first thing I want to point out to you is the fact that Jesus, while being incredibly hyperbolic, is a little bit sarcastic as well. 
I mean, I, can, I, I, I love so many things about Jesus and his little flavor of sarcasm every now and again. I mean, come on, who lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl? You know, like who does that? The thing is, when we think about lighting a lamp and putting, under, putting it under a bowl, you know, it violates the design of why you would have a lamp in the first place. If you think about the time in history in which these people are placed, it's not like light is something that we can just flip on with a switch. It's not like it's a light bulb I can just screw into the ceiling and all of a sudden it gives light to everything in the house. It's an, it's an intentional thing that you have to do to go and light the lamp and then to hide it under a bowl would not only violate the design, at the same time, it could potentially place the lighter of the lamp in danger. I'm now walking around a house where it's dark. I don't know about you, but when I walk around a house that's dark, my toes pay for it later. You know, I've got kids, which means you're going to step on something. I think there's no torture. I think hell might just be walking barefoot on Legos. <laughs> you can't prove it's not. It could be what it is. Nobody lights a lamp and hides it under a bowl. It violates the design. It's counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense. Instead, they light a lamp and they put it on a stand and it brings light to who? It brings light to everyone in the house. Hmm. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, my light has come, a light has dawned. So what does that mean for you, my followers? It means your plan A. Jesus has come, the rescue mission has begun. Jesus is about to live the perfect life, die the perfect death, rise again. But then he's gonna send to his father in heaven. What's he leaving us with? Baby, we got a plan and a mission. And what are we? We're plan A. You see, that's the thing that I love about Serve Day. Somebody needs the light that you've got. Somebody needs the story that you have. And there are, uh, I cannot tell you the number of times that we've heard from people in the midst of serve day who were driving down the street thinking, nobody knows me, nobody pays attention to me. All of a sudden, tap, tap, tap on the window, window rolls down. Here's a bottle of water. Jesus loves you. That's all I got. The difference that makes in people's lives, the light that is in you cannot be hidden. Jesus actually said to his followers, the house is going to need some light. The house is going to need my light. His followers, how's it going to get there? Jesus says, you're going to bring it. You're going to be salty. You're going to be holy. You're going to be distinct. Listen to me. Don't let, don't let the concept of holiness and purity, don't let the concept of being salty trip you up. We talked about this last week. Don't let it trip you up. Here's the thing about Jesus and his mercy and his grace. I'm not saying that I'm soft on sin. I am saying that when you cry out for his mercy and his grace and you turn away from the thing that you're headed towards, you turn away from sin, you repent and you run wholeheartedly after him. You know what I've always found about God? He meets me right there. Don't let purity and holiness be a thing that trips you up. You want to know the real simple equation? Turn, repent, follow, obey. Simple. The thing is, though, you're going to have to be distinct. You're going to have to be set apart. And you're going to have to bring the light of my salvation, Jesus says, to a world that is so desperately crying out for me. Listen, listen. You were created on purpose for a purpose. You were placed in history for such a time as this. Have you ever thought about why you're born today? You ever thought about why you're born today? I mean, honestly, I can tell you, I've honestly sat down and turned the news on and thought, God, why would you not send David right now? Why would you not send Moses right now? Lord, we need a Joshua to rise up. And you know what the Lord has always responded back with? I sent you. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Why would you light your lamp and put it under a bowl? Instead, shine the light inside of you so that all could see. Then he makes him a big old point in verse 16. He says, in the same way, in the same way as what? In the same way as a city on a hill, in the same way as a lamp on the stand, in the same way, shine your light brightly. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father who is in heaven. Now I'm gonna tell you, I serve a sovereign God. I serve a God who sits on the throne and I'm gonna tell you what else he did for me is he did, he just gave me some marching orders that sound a whole lot like serve day. What do you mean? Well, serve day is a pretty simple concept. What, 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 is, what, what is serve day? Jesus kind of summed it up. Do good. Do good for who? For others. Why? So that I can get some glory. It's pretty simple, right? Do good for other people so I can get some glory. So what are we going to do on Sunday? 
What's, why, why, is, why is Segra and Serve Day, why is it such a big deal? I'll tell you why Segra is such a big deal. Segra is such a big deal because we have worked really closely with our city to identify some areas that need some, I don't know, light of Jesus maybe. Not just light of Jesus, they need some people that go, you know what, we love you, no strings attached, and we're going to show up here and just help with what? what you, whatever you need help with. We've identified some areas with the city that we're planning on doing some work in. But what, what are we going to do on Sunday at Segra? It's pretty simple. We're going to do good. Every single outreach that's a part of that list, if you go to the, if you go to the app, you go to the website to sign up for, the out, for an outreach, every single outreach that we've put together is about doing good. Do good. For who? For others. Now, here's the thing, man. This is arrows out. Showing up at something like Serve Day is one little step in the midst of fulfilling that great commission where we can therefore go. Go where? Outside of here. We're going to get ourselves outside of here and we're going to do some good for others. I don't know if you've noticed this, but Serve Day at Manor Church has never been cut the grass at a Manor Church site. You ever notice that? That's because we're not looking to be the beneficiaries of the good that we're doing. We're trying to do some good for other people. This does not involve fixing up a man of church. This is for others. Why? To bring glory to the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, now, this one can get a little tricky because you might think that what we should do is just do the outreach and just be real quiet about it and not say anything about it. I'm going to tell you a story, and the story is actually telling on myself a little bit. So I was in Food Lion one time, which is the place that I go when my wife texts me on the way home from work and is like, grab these three things. So I went there and I had like two things and I was behind, I was behind this guy and I wasn't really paying attention. And that, I'll be honest with you, I wish that I was better at paying attention. I'm just not very good at paying, to squirrel, um, I'm not very good at paying the attention all the time. So I was doing that in Food Lion, paying absolutely no attention. I did notice the guy in front of me, his hands were a little bit weather beaten. And I thought, yeah, he looks like he's been outside for a bit, but I didn't think much of it. And so he was, he was standing there bringing stuff up and he started fumbling in his pocket. And I noticed just the movement of that. And then the Holy Spirit said, clear as day, pay for his food. So I thought, well, you know, I hope he didn't, I hope he wasn't grocery shopping for the week. So I peeked down the conveyor belt. You know what this dude had on the conveyor belt? Man, he had, him some, he had him some packets of cigarettes, some tuna, and he had some beer. He probably had a cut he was going to pour the beer on, you know, and the, the cigarettes, he was probably going to start a fire or something. You know, I don't know what to do with those. The thing is, Holy Spirit told me, pay for it. So I did. I said, hey, man, you know, I, I, let me pay for this. So he said, oh, thank you. And the, the lady on the, behind the cash register was like, oh, wow, that's so nice and sweet. And then the guy who was bagging the groceries was like, oh, man, that's really cool. And I'll be honest with you, my chest started to puff out a little bit because I thought, yeah, I should probably get like a Boy Scout achievement badge or something. <laughs> Do-gooder of the day. You know, some kind of little something to go home to my wife and be like, eh, this guy does some good. I was feeling pretty good about myself until I walked outside. And then again, absolutely clear as day, I heard God say to me, clear as day, he said, if you don't tell him this was from me, it doesn't count. Man, I felt kicked in the shin, because here's the thing, you know what I just walked my way back on? The thing is, the thing is, I thought, you know what, I just, I won't, you know, I'll just pay for it, you know, no big deal. But all of a sudden the credit started to come to me. And here's the thing, the thing is, I had to be brave. I went and found him in the parking lot and I said, listen, here's the thing. I just got to tell you, I got to be honest with you. When you got up this morning, Jesus saw you and knew you needed to hear from him that he loves you with no strings attached. So I just did that because Jesus told me. Now I tell you what, I felt about this small in that moment because I thought, here are all these people inside heaping praise on me like I'm a good person. You know what? The world doesn't need to know Chris Fletcher's a good person. They need to know that Jesus Christ loves them with no strings attached and gave his life for them. And I could have gotten tripped up on the fact that he had cigarettes and beer and tuna. I could have gotten tripped up on that. But you know what? The Lord told me to do it, so I did it. And then he told me to go tell him, so I did it too. Let me tell you something. I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this, I'm going to bring this back to you. For some of us, Sunday is going to present an opportunity to tell people why you're there. For some of you, Sunday is going to present an opportunity for you to tell somebody, this is why. 
Because you'll get that question on serve day. People ask you, why are you doing this? Now, I'm going to tell you, for some of you, it's going to be your very first time pulling on a red shirt or it's going to be your very first time stepping outside of the walls of a church building and owning the fact that Jesus Christ lives in your heart. For some of you, it's going to be a brave step to even pull that shirt on and walk outside. If that's the step that God's called you to take, baby, do it. Listen to me now. For some of us, we've been doing this a while. Now, before we had this service, we were praying and asking the Lord to, you know, move the storm, get it out of here. And we prayed that the Lord would embolden some of us, give us some opportunities, some divine appointments to meet some people just like I described to you standing at the end of that belt, wondering how they're going to pay for that food. Some of us need to be brave. Some of us are going to need to take a step to tell some people, you know what? I'm out here because Jesus loves me so much. I just wanted to show you that he loves you too. That's it. That's it. Listen, if the light of the world is not of my own making, then we got to make sure they know where the light comes from. Jesus loved us so we love others so they can see him. The foundation of an outreach culture, culture is women and men who decide to follow God in being the salt of the earth. I'm here to bring life. I'm here to bring Jesus and to be the light of the world, not hiding who we are, standing for who we are and taking whatever comes next. Jesus died for you and I'm just here to tell you, he loves you with no strings attached. So what is Sunday? Sunday at Segra is a moment. Sunday at Segra, we get to make a choice. We get to choose to be a city on a hill. We get to choose to be light in darkness. We get to choose to show the light of Jesus to a world that needs to know that someone sees them, to, it needs to know that someone loves them, that needs to know that someone cares about them. And guess what? It's not just me. They need to know that Jesus loves them. Sunday, let's do some good. Sunday, let's look for others and make sure that they know that good is being done to them and for them. But I want to challenge you. Maybe Sunday is your day to tell somebody. Because here's the thing. If the city thinks that Mana Church is awesome, we missed it. If the city thinks that Mana Church is full of good people, we missed it. There's some fruit still on the vine. The thing is, they can't just think we're good people and that we care about them. They need to know that Jesus cares. Yeah. Bow your heads, let me pray for us. Jesus, we're so grateful for your love. Not your sacrifice on the cross, this is a wonderful social club we're holding here. None of it even matters. I wonder if moments like this, if it's not appropriate to remember the joy of your salvation. I tell you some of the most powerful ministry moments I've ever experienced are the moments when the Lord has reminded me of the wonder of the cross in my life. For those of you who know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, let me just tell you something. You're going to pull a red shirt on on Sunday and step out to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the light of the world, but never, ever, for one second, lose the wonder of the mercy that Jesus displayed on that cross. Don't worry, I don't have whack theology. This is not a whack theology statement, but I always remind myself, before I stand and tell people that Jesus died for you, I remind myself, Jesus died for me. He died for you. He loves you. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Being his hands and feet are not an obligation only. They're a joy when you remember the sacrifice that was made for you. Holy Spirit, we're your people. Come and use us mightily on Sunday morning. Father, we pray that you'd hold that rain back, that it would rain after. Let us have a pollen shower after 5 p.m., Lord. 
Take it, send it away, Lord. I pray for, for bright sunshine Sunday morning at Segra Stadium. The people would see the light of Jesus shining from that place in a way that they've never experienced before. I pray that our city would experience revival, Lord. We pray for, Jesus, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be poured out in that place. We love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you keep your head bowed for one more moment, for one more prayer, you know, it's not lost on me as we're standing here talking about being the light of the world. Maybe the problem that you walked in with this evening is that you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe the problem is that your relationship with God is not what it should be. Maybe you prayed a prayer one time, you tried to be good, you tried to live a good life, you tried to work hard, you tried to serve, you tried to, you tried to give money, give of your time, that's not gonna work. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have a sin problem, it's what unites us as humankind. So maybe for you the problem is Jesus needs to be Lord of your life. You need to be walking in relationship with him. So if that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed, I wanna ask you for a really simple action step. In a second, we're gonna pray a prayer out loud together. I promise you, I'm not gonna embarrass you. But if you go listen, that conversation of purity, holiness, and being the light of the world, I need some of that lit in my own life. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I wanna ask you to raise your hand right now and hold it up long enough for me to see it. If that's you and you feel that tug on your heart, that you know that you're not connected with God, you do not have a personal relationship with Him, I want to lead you in a prayer right now. And I want you to pray after me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and dying, for living a perfect life for me. I need you in my life. I need you as my Savior. I love you. Come, take over my life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, please text the name Jesus to the number you see on your screen and pause this part if you need to. Once you text, you will receive a prompt. Simply follow what's instructed. This is a very exciting moment in your life and I just wanna say congratulations to you. This is the most important decision that you can make and I'm so happy that you made it. And we at Mana Church would love to come alongside you and assist you as you begin your personal journey with Jesus. Mana Church, thank you again for joining us online today. If you would like someone to pray with you, take a moment and text the word prayer to the number that you see on your screen. We have a team that's ready and waiting to connect with you to see how we can pray for you in any area of your life. God bless you, Mana Church. We'll see you right back here next week. We live in a society where it's hard to get a decent job without a college education. But let's be honest, a piece of paper isn't the only thing that lands you a job. Employers want people that have education and experience. The experience is a full-time college internship that combines both formal academics with practical hands-on training outside of the classroom. 
While in the experience, students take accredited Bible classes at one of the top 20 Christian colleges in the nation, while gaining world-class leadership training from one of the nation's largest and fastest growing churches. With several degree programs and track options available, the experience allows you to tailor the internship around your personal and professional goals. So maybe you're a young adult looking to pursue vocational ministry, or maybe you're just looking to gain some professional skills and strengthen your biblical understanding before chasing after your dream. Either way, the experience can help you forge a foundation of faith, character, and leadership to equip you for the road ahead.